Hello and welcome to the TTI Distribution Download, the podcast where we talk about all things happening in the world of electronic components with the specialists of TTI. Thanks, Jim. Factory automation will be critical in bringing manufacturing back to America. In this three-part podcast series with the Agio Group, we'll discuss the different challenges facing engineers and some of the key innovations available to make that happen. My name is Pat Denton. I am the Director of Sales and Engineering here at TTI. I've been here for uh, about 12 years in, in the Fort Worth facility. With us today from the Agio Group are Peter Blaze, Senior Director, Head of Digital Development and Technical Marketing, and Simon Reuning, Global Technical Marketing Manager with uh, the Agio Group. So, Peter, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Thank you, Pat. So, my name is Peter Blaze, and I have been with, originally, Kemet, which is now Yajo, for well over 20 years. Electrical engineer by training. Been in the industry for longer than my time at Kemet. And uh, just think of me as a jack-of-all-trades. I've been involved in technology for several decades, and really, whether it's small power, big power, digital, I cover it all also amongst all of the major industrial sectors that are out there. So thank you, Pat, for having me here today. Thanks. And Simon? My name is Simon Reuning, and I'm the Global Technical Marketing Manager with Yagio Group. I've been with Yagio Group now for five years, and before that, I used to be a power supply designer, and I did that for many, many years. And that's really where my passion came from, to really teach people about power, power supply designs. And I've done multiple patents in those areas as well. And so now as we start looking into today's topic, I think that experience really comes to play. And yeah, I just really enjoy teaching other people about what we learn in power and how our components can fit into the latest and greatest technology. That's, that's great. And we're happy to have both of you guys here today. In this first episode, we'll be discussing big power the high voltage, high power drive units. So first question for the two of you guys, how are recent innovations in big power and high voltage systems reshaping the design and implementation of drive units in industrial and automotive applications? Well, that's a great question, Pat. And first of all, let's talk about big power in general. You know, you you probably know I am originally from Rhode Island and Rhode Island is the home of the America's industrial revolution centered around the Blackstone River Valley. And when it all started back in the 1700s, it was based on hydropower, which at the time was big power. You needed the flowing water to turn the water wheels, which powered the mills, whether it was for textiles or, or metal or fabrication or whatever. Fast forward to the current time where we're transitioning from industrial 4.0 to industrial 5.0, we're still talking about big power. But instead of water, we are talking about a river of electrons. And what we're seeing today is increased level of factory automation and more intelligent factory automation, which is consuming ever greater power. Now, as it consumes more power, we need to go and be able to deliver more power from the grid. And we also need to be able to efficiently manage that power within our factory automation environments. Managing big power, it can really present some challenges. What challenges will engineers face and how will component manufacturers like the Agio Group address those challenges? Well, I think when we start looking at the big power for factory automation, we really have to break this down into two parts. The first part would be how does the power actually get to the factory, right? Because there's going to be more and more buildings, more and more factory automation happening. So that means the grid is going to be under a lot of additional stresses. And so there's going to be different monitoring systems, uh, voltage sensors, current sensors that are involved outside of the factory itself. And then the second part would be what happens within the factory. So within the factory, you're also going to have a lot of different power management because so much more is going to be integrated with robotics, with motor drives and different systems that are just going to demand more power. And so we really have to think about this from both perspectives of how does the power get to the building and what do we do with the power inside of the building? 
And there can be all kinds of anomalies that also happen that we have to prepare for. That means if you have a lightning strike happening, how do I protect my equipment within? Other things could be a transformer goes out outside of your building. Now you have power fluctuations inside of your building. You, of course, want to make sure that you don't break everything inside. So you have to have proper protection and really ensure that the power delivery is guaranteed. How is the integration of advanced passive components like those developed by Yagio enabling you know, better reliability, performance in the drive units operating at these high voltages? So I want to go back a little bit to what Simon was talking about and breaking it down to um, external to the factory and then internal to the factory. So if we're talking about the grid, um, one of the challenges uh, with factory automation is obviously we need to provide continuous clean power to the factory. You don't want to have it interrupted, which means you need to have a very stable grid. Now, as factories ramp up and ramp down in production, there's fluctuations in power demand. So you need to have a grid which is intelligent. So therefore, as load varies, you need to be able to intelligently reroute the electrons flow in the grid through different paths going from the power source to the factory. So this is uh, basically you've got an intelligence added to the power grid. And, and um, our components, typically very large film, electri- film capacitors, um, go into systems which allow the utility companies to go and monitor the flow of power to make sure that you're not overloading any of the transmission lines and so that you're able to provide more stable power to the factories. And then the second thing is should there be an issue with the transmission uh, of power through the the power lines, whether it be uh, something that's environmental, uh, you don't want, you need to be monitoring the power on those lines. And if there's an issue, you need to be able to go and detect the fault and stop the transmission. So our components are also used in those systems that are used by utilities. So that is used to add safety to the power transmission and also really reliability and consistency of the power delivery system. Once you're in the factory for power, the issue now is you need to take the power and convert it to the different stages. So whether it's big power, such as doing an industrial drive and creating motion, um, you need to go and convert the power to something that's going to be usable by, say, an AC motor. So therefore, you've got power film caps, you've got aluminum electrolytics, and you also got some magnetics. A lot of magnetics are used in the transformation of power and also the mitigation of electrical noise. And so we provide all of those technologies going into the factory automation environment. Okay, good. You, you mentioned some of your components. What other, what other types of key innovations have been made for, uh, for the big power in, in the factories? Well, I think one of the big things we have to start looking at is the implementation for silicon carbide and gallium nitride. So with those types of switching technologies, we're dealing with significantly higher switching frequencies, You also have higher voltages, and just in general, the wide band gap allows for higher switching frequencies. Now, with these switching frequencies, you're going to start having issues first on the EMI side, but also you have to have different technologies that you implement. That means your X7R capacitor has to be considered to be a COG type of capacitor just because you're dealing with much higher frequencies. That also means for the switch mode power supplies that you're using, you have to make sure that the proper magnetics are being used, the proper capacitors are used for resonance supplies, and that all plays a role into it. Um, you have to consider the different technologies that you implement in those devices. And so that, that's one of the parts that's really important to consider. So Simon, I'd like to build on top of that because you were pursuing a, a very good topic, and that is, with the adoption of wide band gap, predominantly silicon carbide or gallium nitride, what that has necessitated for the passive component industry is really material science development. Because the old technology of components simply won't handle the 
you know, the stresses placed on them by the, uh, the new generation wide band gap semiconductors. And that really boils down to the higher frequencies, the higher temperatures, and also the much higher transition times. So if we take a look at, let's say, magnetics materials, a few things are happening. Number one is you're resonating typically at much higher frequencies, so you need to change the architecture of your magnetics and also the materials that are used in those magnetics. Secondly, if we're looking at EMI emissions, um, which are being generated from the switches transitioning from off to on. It happens at a much more rapid rate. So therefore, you get a spectrum of noise that ventures much further into higher frequencies than what we do with the older technology silicon. What ends up happening is that you need materials that are able to absorb the stuff over broader frequency ranges and higher frequency ranges. So therefore, our material scientists have gone and developed nanocrystal materials versus ferrite-based materials. And the advantage there is these, te- these materials tend to have very broad, fr- very broad spectrum responses. Um, and also, they're able to have responses that allow you to reduce the dB of noise greater than, say, uh, older technology materials. And then in the capacitor world, because you're dealing with higher frequencies, you need materials that are able to operate at very low losses at higher frequencies. So we're seeing a migration from polypropylene-based materials to calcium zirconate-based ceramic materials, which are C0G in designation, for the big power conversion circuitry. Yeah, and that all also plays a role when you start talking about precision, right? With more noise going into the system, we have to make sure we filter it because precision becomes key. The more automation you have, you need to make sure that the robot arm is moving in the the correct direction, stops where it needs to stop, and you don't have room for a lot of noise because everything has to be exactly precise. And so implementing the proper components to filter out this new high-frequency noise that we're dealing with um, becomes a big key for our precision of the motion of the robotic arms or whatever else is being implemented there. Right, right. And and some of the new innovations you were talking about, does that affect the reliability? I mean, everybody wants, you know, good reliability in their factories, right? So how does that affect the reliability in these factories? I think that comes down to scale, right? Because everything has to be smaller, um, more power in more compact spaces. And of course, people want a cheaper. That's always the, the extra requirement that it comes along with that. But just when you start looking at how much components have to fit in a smaller space, you really have to th- start thinking about how do I thermally manage this? How do I get the heat out if I generate heat? Or how do I even prevent from generating too much heat? And that comes down to when you start working on a transformer design, picking the proper material like you used to use ferrite, maybe you have to start switching into a nanocrystalline type of material. Or if you're designing a transformer, maybe you have to work with a design house and say, hey, I'm using a resonant design. Can I maybe implement my inductor, my capacitance, and my transformer in all one package to properly manage the heat and have a smaller space? So it really comes down to focusing on each individual component, making sure you have the latest and greatest technology in those areas, and even further, working closer with the design engineers to implement uh, better technology or more adapted technology for the specific application that you're doing. Peter, you mentioned Industry 4.0 and 5.0. What what type of emerging technologies in big power should engineers be looking at to keep their competitive edge on their designs going forward? So we talked about already about silicon carbide wide band gap, and generally that is the trend that's moving forward. Um, that's, I don't see that reversing in any manner whatsoever. And so that's placing more demand on the components. And from a, uh, when these systems are designed, it's critical that the design engineer work closely with the, the vendors, whether it's, uh, working with TTI, with Yajo Group or another supplier, it's critical that the suppliers understand really the mission profiles that the passive components are going to be subjected to. Because when the des- 
manufacture the component understands the mission profile. That we're talking about the the spectrum of frequencies going and the power levels going through it and the ambient temperatures. They can go and do a lot of simulation and modeling to ensure that the part is going to perform reliably. Now, when we look at going from industry 4.0 to industry 5.0, you know, one of the shifts that will occur is when we look at manufacturing uh, or automation, right now everything tends to be, I guess, singular in nature. You have a machine or a robot doing one task. Uh, and one way of looking at it is if you're, uh, let's say you're an assembly line building cars. Well, you've got a robot and it's stamping a metal panel for a door. And it just does that one thing over and over and over. Well, when we evolve into Industry 5.0, instead of that assembly line building one car or one vehicle, maybe different colors, but it's the same vehicle, it's going to be very flexible in terms of being able to build any vehicle. And so that station that was originally stamping the door panel, it may need to stamp different door panels. And instead of just a door panel, it may be able to stamp a hood or a trunk lid. It needs to be very, very flexible based on what the market is dictating. So you're going to see production lines that build lots of different product. So you may see a sports car, you may see a pickup truck, you may see a, a piece of farm equipment all going down the same production line. So what that necessitates is that the automation equipment, the robotics have much more degrees of freedom in terms of their actuation and their movement. And what that places on the supply base is that you need to design components that are more power dense and are going to be placed in far greater quantities with more degrees of freedom of movement within these systems. And so that's going to place a lot of design challenges because you've got power densification and you're going to just have a whole lot more of these things put into the same physical area or volume. Yeah, and I think, uh, Pat, you already may have brought out a shocker for people because we just talked about Industry 4.0. Now, Industry 5.0 is already coming. It's like, I just got used to 4.0. But, you know, a lot of these implementations that Peter was mentioning for Industry 5.0, I just want to kind of help our listeners define what that actually means. And it's just going to be more of what we do with 4.0 with more automation. And Peter talked about how you start having a manufacturing floor, manufacturing a car that can do one product can do multiple jobs now. So you, you're not just running pickup trucks, then you're running sports cars. You, you can do that at the same time with different types of products. And these, these robotics, they're going to have to be able to maneuver uh, different types of weights, different types of uh, motions, all in the same floor. And so that, that's really what becomes important because all the integration for power um, is going to have to be able to manage different loads. And that means for future proofing that you, you're going to have to think of that on a, on a power level. Nowadays, we're le dealing three, 400 watts, and then later they're going to be in the kilowatts. And you have to be able to have products that can manage that already thinking ahead on the manufacturing floor because you don't want to replace your products in five years because now it's out of date. You want to be able to have power supplies that can power these devices thinking of the future. So that that's a, an important factor to mention that Industry 5.0 is going to be capable of doing everything in one manufacturing floor. Thank you for your insights on, uh, on big power. And in this episode and next episode, we're going to talk about small power, or little power. So thank you again for your time and we'll see you on the next episode. That's it for this episode of the TTI Distribution Download. For more information on any of the topics you heard about today, reach out to your nearby TTI branch at 1-800-CALL-TTI or visit us online at tti.com.